everyone, and welcome to Reimagining the Future of the Legal Work Environment, the first webinar in Penn Carey Law School's Future of the Profession Initiatives Spring Webinar Series on Reimagining the Future of the Legal Profession. I'm Jen Leonard, Executive Director of the Future of the Profession Initiative, and I'll be your moderator for today's program. Over the next five weeks, we'll explore a variety of topics that highlight all the change happening around us in the model, modern legal profession. We'll explore topics that include using artificial intelligence and machine learning in legal services delivery, the future of racial equity in the legal profession, the future of legal regulatory reform, and the future of lawyer formation. Today, though, we'll launch our series with a discussion about the future of the legal work environment. We planned a dynamic and engaging conversation about what those environments will look like, particularly as we look beyond the primarily remote work environments most of us are accustomed to during the COVID-19 pandemic. In a few moments, I'll introduce our expert guests, but first, a few housekeeping items. We know you'll have lots of great questions for our panelists, so we encourage you to use the Q&A feature found on the ribbon at the bottom of the window. The Q&A portion of our program will be facilitated by 2L Penn Law student, Lexi Levine, beginning at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you'd like to upvote any questions, please use your controls to do so, and Lexi will select the most popular questions to present to our guest expert. Please keep your questions topical and appropriate. Anyone posting inappropriate content will be removed from the webinar. Also, we have a new element that we've added to our upcoming programming. If you're like me, you really missed the opportunity that in-person conferences gave you to hear from these great experts and then talk during networking receptions about how you'll take the lessons that you learned and apply them in your own legal work environment. So today we'll have a post-webinar discussion for those of you who want to do just that. And we'll discuss all the themes that come out of the conversation over the next 75 minutes or so. These discussions will begin at 4.30 Eastern Standard Time, and we'll share more information about them near the end of our webinar. If you're seeking CLE credit for today's event, please note that CLE codes will be presented twice per hour. We'll need you to write them down and enter them on your digital evaluation form once the event is over. The evaluation form is mandatory to receive CLE credit. Please find the link to the evaluation in the chat. These codes will let us know how long you attended. Attendees must attend the post-webinar breakout discussions from 4.30 to 5.30 Eastern Standard Time to receive two credits of CLE. And now I'm going to announce the first CLE passcode. Are you ready? The passcode is NEON, N-E-O-N. And now without further ado, I'll invite our panelists to join the discussion. I'll share a little bit of background on each panelist, but you can learn more about our panelist background by visiting our event splash page at futureofthelegalprofession.org. So first we're joined by Dr. Milana Hogan, Chief Talent Officer with Sullivan and Cromwell. Milana is an active member of the National Association for Law Placement, or some of you might know it now, and she's Vice Chair of the Professional Development Consortium. She also serves as a liaison to the ABA's Commission on Women in the Profession and is co-chair of the Commission's GRIT project, a post that grew out of the dissertation she wrote while a doctoral student at Penn. Welcome to the webinar, Milana. We're happy to have you here. Next, we're joined by Marcel Pratt, incoming managing partner of Ballard Spars Philadelphia office. Marcel represents clients in high stakes litigation and investigation. He's a media past city solicitor, chief legal officer for the city of Philadelphia and the leader of a 330 member law department. Marcel was the youngest person in Philadelphia's history to be appointed and confirmed by city council as city solicitor. He graduated from Penn with a BA in economics and from Temple University Beasley School of Law where he served on the Temple Law Review. And finally, we're joined by Penn Law alum, Ed Soam, Ed is Senior President and Head of Solutions with Factor, a leader in delivering complex legal work at scale. Ed oversees the customization of Factor's talent, workflow, and technology to fit client needs. He's an attorney, legal technologist, and managed services leader, having held numerous roles as an executive with Pangea 3, Thomson Reuters, and EY Law. He's also written and spoken extensively about legal innovation, including as co-author of the Alt Legal column on Above the Law. 
So with all of that behind us, I'm so excited to jump into this discussion because I know that our panelists have really interesting thoughts about what is going to happen uh, in the future of our legal work environments. And for the record, we are going to stipulate that the year 2020, which is now behind us, was a very unusual year in legal work environments. Most of us who are participating in this webinar have experienced firsthand the move to almost entirely remote work um, and all of the many complications and uh, innovations that happened in 2020. So we are not gonna focus on 2020. Instead, we're going to think about how are we strategically designing the legal work environments that will follow this COVID-19 lockdown? So we really wanna focus there and helping our leaders think about the conversations they're having with their workforces, um, some of the trends that they might want to be aware of now and uh, integrating into their post-COVID plans. So with all of that, I am going to start off with Milana uh, to lead us in this conversation. And then I hope Marcella and Ed will jump in on this question as well. Milana, we could tell a little bit about what's happening in the legal profession right now. We have metrics that we traditionally rely, on, rely upon, things like profits per partner, productivity. Uh, we were just talking about on-campus interviewing and yields and all of these data-driven metrics that give us some sense of what's happening. And in 2020, it looked like many of those metrics were actually up. But of course, that only tells part of the story. There are lots of things happening in our work environments that are messy, nebulous, that it's really hard to discern, especially when we're working remotely. So could you talk a little bit about some of the uh, less quantifiable trends that might be happening and dynamics in our workforces, how we identify them, how we measure them, and think about how we fold all of that learning into our post-COVID work environment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and thank you for having me here. I will start with that. This is such an interesting topic and um, really excited to be part of this panel and to, to learn from everybody on it. Um, so you, you sort of hit the nail on the head with the, you know, with the topic of measurement, um, which is really difficult, I think, in an environment like this. And we do know, uh, as you said, uh, what our lawyers are working on, we know what matters they're working on, we know how much they're working, those are sort of the easier items to look at and to get a good sense of um, their sort of logical data that you turn to that tells you all of those things. Um, but there are a whole host of things that we don't know. And I think in many respects, uh, you could say that the jury is still out on what the impact of remote working has been on, on each of those things. So you know, when I think about what those are, certainly, you know, professional development would be one of them, which is a very broad umbrella. But when you sort of look at what has the move to remote work done to the professional development of the lawyers in the firm, um, you know, it's, it's really difficult to say for sure. And I think there is sort of among many people a sense that, um, you know, that that has suffered in some way, but that is harder to put your finger on. So, you know, under that umbrella, I think would be things like, you know, are, are people still able to develop team leadership skills and management skills in a remote environment where we're not all physically in the same room? Um, can you still build those skills this way? Is leading a Zoom meeting the same thing as leading a meeting when you have a room full of people and you have to hold everybody's attention? Um, you know, so I think those are things that, you know, it's really unclear at this point how and to what extent those have been impacted. And then the flip side of that is I think there are other things also under that umbrella that may in fact have been improved during this time in a strange way. And so, you know, as I think about, and I think as anybody would be thinking about how do you design or think about the future of the workspace, you know, you really have to think hard about what are we solving for? You know, what, what actually are the problems? How can we see them? And what can we do about them? And then what did we do that maybe is an improvement that we should retain? So, you know, we, we've been thinking really hard about that particular piece of it, the measurement piece. And I think, you know, like, like everybody, I think the place we are is, you know, we know some things, but we don't yet know enough. We're still in the midst of it. Um, but we do want to make sure that we are setting up systems that allow us 
see some of those things more clearly. So I think, you know, it would be sort of a fool's errand to go out and create an entire model for the future of the profession, you know, without really understanding uh, more granularly what we would want to be solving for. And to just explore that a little bit more with you, Milana and Marcel and Ed, if you want to jump in as well, recognizing that it's all sort of unknown, that you need to be aware of it and planning for it, but you also don't know what you're trying to be aware of and what you're planning for on the other side. Are there recommendations that you have for leaders of um, even themes that they should be focusing on uh, and, and trying to develop some questions and some frameworks even if we don't yet have the metrics, even if we haven't yet figured out whether this behavior among our workforce is a pro or a con, just the intentionality of setting out um, almost a rubric of, you know, here's what we want to be aware of, um, and, and we don't know yet what we're going to do with it. Are there, are there themes that leaders should be looking for or behaviors? Uh, Marcel, I, I see you jumping in there, too, if you wanted to share some of your thoughts. Yeah, I was going to answer that question and also follow up on what something Milana said about the measurements. I think the two of the biggest things firms are grappling with is maintaining office culture and morale in this environment. And those are things that, you know, you can't necessarily measure. But I think those are themes that uh, everyone should have uh, on their on their minds. And, you know, it's very hard to recreate what you had in your office. And I know every office is very different, you know, has its own personality. Um, but I think, you know, whether it's a practice group leader or a department head, you have to be very conscious of trying your best to recreate um, some kind of social environment. So uh, I'll give an example. One of the things that I did was uh, I have an hour on my calendar every week where um, I leave my virtual office door open. So we use WebEx. WebEx I have a personal room and um, anyone can just pop in at any time. Uh, and, you know, it's almost kind of like knocking on the door because you have to, you know, let me know that you're waiting in the lobby. Um, but I, I think it's, it's small things like that, that you have to, that everyone has to be cognizant of in order to maintain office culture and environment. I also think so much of the practice of law is building your profile and building a network. And we also don't know how that's going to be impacted you know, due to COVID, due to being in, in a remote environment, um, because we know that our lawyers can't get out as much as they used to. They, they're not meeting as many people, you know, as they as they used to. Even if you take this event, for example, you know, there would be some point afterwards where uh, there's room for mingling. People would be walking around, having one on one conversations. You know, we can we can try our best to, you know, recreate that and, and, and break our rooms and such. But we don't know what the long term impact that's going to be on. Uh, the, the networking and profile raising for, for some of our lawyers. Yeah. And I think I'll just add to that, you know, the other major unknown is um, there are some things that are sort of generally known that uh, we intellectually can accept things like uh, we know that, you know, mental health is definitely an, an not an awesome place across the board, but that doesn't always surface. It's not always well known, you know, where is there, where are their spikes in anxiety and depression and how are they having an impact on, you know, productivity or, um, you know, client quality, um, things like that. I mean, there are just these things that, that are really um, difficult to measure. Uh, and I agree with what Milana was saying. I mean, we, you, you sort of need to understand where you're going to even start to explore, uh, create baselines, um, you know, at, whenever there's sort of standards that are being set, you know, on things like this, on how you, you measure metrics, there's always a top down and a bottom up approach, right? Where it's like, here are the things we care about and that we are proactive and intentional about and things that we want to be hallmarks of our culture and our organizations and things that we, you know, really um, value at a very core level around our people uh, and our business. And then there's things bottom up in terms of like, just where are we? And is that, and what's the definition of good? Um, and sort of, and, and what becomes also normative, what's actually, well, this is not something, you know, I, I like what Marcel was saying. Um, and it's almost like, it's not about recreating some of those opportunities as it is just creating them because we're not going to be able, they're not going to take the same form or medium as they have in sort of the previous iteration. 
And so things like Open Door WebEx, it's awesome that you're able to make that work. Uh, I've always toyed with the idea, but I was like, I don't know, who, is anyone going to come? What if like a bunch of people come in the same time and there's conflicting conversations and crossed wires? But I think it requires that experimentation. And so, um, you know, I really agree with that. Experimenting, baselining, and also kind of setting out your initiatives on what it is that you want to measure uh, gives us at least a, a place to start uh, and to start investigating some of those things that, that lie like one level underneath the surface. Yeah, and, and you know, I know we've all had experience. You're talking about experimentation, Ed, and, and mental health and engagement of our workforce. I know early on in the pandemic, lots of organizations were making efforts to make sure people stayed connected through social events that were all virtual, right? And then that became sort of an added obligation that people needed to attend and stay on their screens longer. Uh, and it became something that people really maybe didn't look forward to as much staying connected to their colleagues. Um, and I think to Marcel's point about uh, developing relationships in a pre-COVID world and the way that that used to drive our industry um, in a post-COVID world, one thing I know that I've discovered is that I've missed those opportunities, but I've also had the opportunities to join networks that are more global uh, that I probably would not have participated in before I met people you know, in the UK and Israel and Asia um, so finding ways to keep those new networking opportunities alive so that we don't immediately go back to just everybody we're physically in a room with, um, but also, you know, recognizing that we hope that that will become part of our, our culture again. Um, I wanted to go back to Marcel, uh, if I could, for a minute. And Marcel, you were a member of the, um, the first lost generation, quote unquote, of law firm associates because you graduated law school immediately after the Great Recession. There was a lot of talk about what would happen to all of you um, coming into this uncertain environment. It, certainly, we're thrilled that it, you have done it quite well for yourself uh, as a member of that generation. But we see talk in the literature now about this being the next lost generation. People who are graduating from law school and spend their first year or two with their organizations entirely virtually. Uh, do you think that that's a way to think about it, that they might be a lost generation? Or are there other things um, that we can, we can sort of hold up as things that they might take advantage of as the first group to do that? Um, that's a really good question. I don't, I don't think there's a lost generation. I don't think... Um, Although, I mean, the, the title sounds interesting, but, um, you know, I, I think it just creates opportunity for a new a new journey. And as you were asking the question, I was just thinking about what happened in, in, in 2008, 2009. So I was a summer associate at Ballard. Summer was great. I mean, a lot of firms were doing really well. Um, a, a local firm made a lot of headlines for, you know, taking 50 summer associates to London. Um, so firms were, firms were doing great. Uh, and the fall is when the economy tanked. And everyone was just immediately frightened. You know, firms in the U.S. shut down. Um, summer classes were canceled. Offers were revoked. Uh, you know, I was uh, reading above the law every day, which created a lot of anxiety. And I remember, uh, you know, second semester of my 3.0 year, um, I'm checking my email. And there's an email from a partner that says, let me know if you need help finding something. And I don't know what that means. It's very ambiguous. But you know, I scroll down a few more emails and there's a message from the hiring partner explaining a program where they were going to pay us stipends to work in public interest or pretty much do anything that was not for profit. So we had folks from our class do all sorts of things, public defender's office, teach high school history for a year. You know, there were some folks in my law school class who didn't have those opportunities. So, you know, they bartended, you know, hung a shingle, did all sorts of different things. Um, but, you know, what I think it taught all of us was a lesson in being resilient. Um, you know, it forced us to take risks, to think about our careers in uh, a different ways. Um, because with, you know, going to law school, um, you know, having your career mapped out, you know, lawyers tend to think in very linear ways and, you know, you have a path for your career, but for us, this kind of, you know, upset everything. Um, and, I, and I do see some parallels to what, you know, current law school graduates are going, are going through um, and, you know, a lot of inconveniences, disrupted expectations. Um, but I do think there are a lot of lessons that are going to be learned. Some of the same things around being resilient, uh, adapting to different circumstances, you know, learning to practice law uh, under circumstances that are not ideal. Um, and I also think the backdrop of what we're going through as a country will also 
uh, guide and inform a lot of careers. I mean, right now we're in this moment where we're talking about, uh, you know, social justice and inequality in healthcare. Um, and the importance of lawyers is just really at the forefront. And so I think no matter where you go, if it's a big firm, government, in-house, you know, academia, you know, it's this, what we're going through is going to shape your career. And so I think anyone who's starting their career out at this moment should really lean into it um, and, and realize that this is going to benefit you or have, you know, great implications in the long run. It's, a, it's interesting to hear you share that story, Marcel, because I think at that very same moment, I was at the city law department and, and we were taking advantage of, of the conditions to bring people who had been deferred from their summer associateships to come and work with us uh, for part of the time when they didn't have an opportunity. So I wondered if you had thoughts about how um, being the person who just led that department, how some of these um, government and uh, nonprofit organizations might also take advantage um, of the current conditions and the social justice climate that we're experiencing uh, to find new connections for people who might feel a little bit lost. Yeah, uh, what I left out was that I, I used my externship to go to the city law department. So, you know, I was one of the folks that was there for, you know, a year at no cost to the city, um, you know, taking on a lot of work and, and that was the best experience uh, you know, that I could have had. And, you know, just to talk about that a little bit more, you know, initially you're upset because it's not ideal. You, you thought you were going to a firm, but in retrospect, probably the best thing that could have happened for my career, you know, it was a great detour. Um, I think there, there could be some opportunity for, you know, uh, government offices and public interest organizations. Um, you know, I know I had some discussions with some firms who were thinking about uh, having like an externship program it's, it's different from 2008, 2009 in the sense of the economic hit is not as bad. I mean, firms did, some firms did really well uh, in 2020 where that wasn't the case in 2008, 2009. Um, but I know some firms are thinking of the idea because we got some outreach at the city law department. Um, but certainly I think there's opportunity just, you know, going back to the moment that we're in, I think, you know, some folks who might've thought you know, I want to start my career out in, you know, private practice, you know, they've started to think more about going into public interest initially, or maybe going into government and doing something there, um, because of the moment that we're in. Yeah. Um, if I could just follow up with one sort of uh, government and public interest organization question for you, Marcel, just since mm -hmm. you did lead an organization during uh, lockdown, are there uh, challenges that those offices have. I know that the technology tends not to be as cutting edge as in the private sector. Uh, there, there's more of a, um, in some places, a cultural difference mm -hmm. around working remotely. Um, will those organizations, do you think, have greater challenges than some of their more nimble peers might have in the private sector? Absolutely, because I think when you're in government and public interest, you're running to the trouble or you're, you're having to deal with it. And so, you know, just taking the city law department as an example, there were some lawyers who never worked from home, you know, because they did child welfare cases and you can't do those virtually. And, you know, we had the double problem of both standing up in office and running it during COVID and then also advising city government on how to um, save lives, basically, just to, just to put it straightforward. Um, so that, that was very difficult. And of course, folks were going through their own personal issues at home. But uh, on the administrative side, it, it was actually pretty easy once we got um, laptops in people's hands. So we did not have laptops issued to every lawyer in government. That might not surprise some folks. Um, whereas I know some law firms, if you just went to the office, grabbed your laptop and went home, you know, it, it made it easy to do it overnight. But with the city, we didn't have that. So it took us some time, you know, to get people plugged in. But, you know, once we did that, it was it was fairly, fairly easy. But um but again, we still had folks who didn't have the luxury of working from home. And just even outside of our child welfare group, you know, our tax lawyers, you know, some of our code enforcement lawyers, they had, had to come in and, and, and go to the go to the trouble. Um, and wasn't ideal, but I think, you know, that's a part of the, um, I don't want to say joy, but the allure of being in public service because you're you're helping out, you're you're in the mix, you're thrown right into the fire, and at the end of the day, you're you're helping um, society. Great, thank you. And uh, you know, one of the really interesting things that was happening even before this lockdown are just the number of different generations occupying a single workplace and the different ways that people think about um, work. And I'm going to start with you, Ed, and thinking about 
you know, we're talking about legal professionals who've been in practice sometimes for four or five decades, maybe. Um, and they have a very specific idea of a physically based practice environment that is relationship driven, um, that involves space time um, and, and coming into a city center, you know, in a lot of cases to work. And now on the other end of the spectrum, we have people who are starting the first two years of their careers, never having had any of that exposure. And even before that, being comfortable in virtual environments. So Ed, how are legal organizations like yours, um, and then I'd love to hear from our panelists at large law firms, how is a place like Factor thinking about how to position itself with respect to those um, new lawyers and also being attractive to people who have more experience as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think that law firms, you know, I've spent five and a half years at a law firm, and I think that in general, um, there persists there persisted a culture of, uh, at, in varying degrees at different places, um, some expectation of FaceTime, some expectation of in-person, you know, time spent together, that that's not easily replicable. And I think there's an interesting deconstruction that happens when you put are put into like a COVID year that says, okay, well, what was it about that FaceTime that made it so necessary? And, you know, it's easy to kind of jump to a solution and say, well, I don't know what it is, but I want more of it because I need it. And you know, not get overly analytical until it's taken away and say, well, you know, as Marcel was mentioning, like, how do you replicate that? How do you sort of find another avenue where you can, um, you know, reap the benefit of that? And uh, I've struggled with it, frankly, um, because I think uh, in part there, there is actually a communication substrate that exists in all in, in, in person interactions that I think we actually rely upon because we're habituated to it to, you know, um, to foster communication about the business itself, to actually foster communication about, oh, I'm working on this. This is what I'm working on. I, I ran into so-and-so in the hallway. They mentioned this thing, you know, could there be an antitrust issue in this litigation? Like I'll go, you know, just grab someone for coffee and, and figure it out. Where now the only way to make that happen is to be prescriptive and to get, you know, a Zoom call together and to find time on the calendar. So it's not easy actually, um, but I think that there is an opportunity to rethink uh, some of the things that we that sort of faded into the background uh, as a for granted, and then to really reevaluate whether or not those are necessary things. One of the things that factor is, is that, and like many organizations, we um, had a scale up mentality where we've been around for over a decade, but we're as an independent company for less than a year, we canceled our lease in New York, just canceled it. Nope, no, no reason to have it. It's kind of made sense. So we just haven't gone back to the office. Uh, we ha have global outposts in Belfast and in Roslov in Poland. Um, those uh, were obviously, you know, following the advice of the government in terms of when they opened and closed at various times. But it actually also opened up, you know, our view on talent. Um, where can we recruit people if everyone is working remotely? If people are adopting those skills, where are other pockets of talent? That's an important part of our value proposition and factor is leveraging the very best of global workforce um, to solve, you know, uh, the best uh, problems for best clients. And I think that that it becomes a new normal in terms of even our people strategy and where we might recruit from and how we can actually take that strength and competitive advantage in the ALSP world and uh, magnify it actually, um, because we can actually uh, start to have almost virtual centers of work where we can get talent from anywhere uh, to do anything. And, and for that to feel like a norm and not like an exception to the rule really enables a certain amount of business flexibility. And I don't think we're the only ones to have figured that out. I think others are also, you know, you see job postings that say location remote, you know, and that's uh, just anywhere, I guess that there's internet. So, you know, that, that's something that uh, I think will be a trend that continues uh, in terms of um, kind of new norms. Yeah. And I think it's such an interesting point you make about these spontaneous sort of interactions that we have. I know there have been at the beginning of the pandemic, there was this thought that now we're going to be so innovative because we're we're forcing experimentation of things that we've never done before. But a lot of the innovation comes from what our colleagues over at engineering, which I the phrase I love called like spontaneous collisions of humans <laughs> that are required to spark new ideas, to have conversations in the hallway, um, to just sort of hang out after a meeting and talk about other projects. And now you sort of see that 
host ended the meeting thing on your computer screen and it's all over and you go off to doing your own thing. Yeah. Um, did, did you want to add something? Well, no, just one other comment. I forgot to answer like why it's different for ALSPs than maybe at law firms. And one of the things is that um, some of the precedent uh, in terms of that culture that's been around for sometimes hundreds of years, uh, we don't have that actually. So flipping to pure remote, you know, I joined Factor actually uh, in the middle of the pandemic, which means I haven't met most of my coworkers. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how tall they are. And like, sort of, there's lots of, like, I've only, they're literally two dimensional squares on my screen. Like that's my entire experience of that person, which is very, very weird for me. Um, and I think that uh, we can adjust and be more flexible and not feel like, well, how do we go and like replace this thing that's been time honored and uh, part of the fabric of how we've operated for hundreds of years, because we don't have that history. And so we can just say, well, I guess we do things like this now. And, you know, our employee population and the people that we recruit uh, possess similar agility. Um, and, you know, again, like I said, everyone will get there, I think, but it's just easier to be more decisive and flip a switch at a place that's still kind of new and determining how, how we operate. Yeah, and, I, and now I'm going to turn back to uh, two professionals who are working in organizations that are steeped in history and do have um, really established cultures. And I think one of the most difficult things to be thinking about is um, that we've gone from these work environments that were sort of, quote unquote, normal to everybody and the expectations were pretty uniform across the board. Um, and now we have people in our work environments who say, I don't ever want to go back to the office again. I love working from home um, and making arguments that, you know, I can bill using the time that I used to be sitting on the train or fighting traffic and I'm actually being more productive. Um, but then I see, you know, headlines about how partners want their associates back at the office. Um, they want that FaceTime. So how can leaders be sort of resolving the tension or at least thinking about the tension among all of those groups in a way that you're you're capturing your talent, making your talent happy so that, you know, maybe they're not leaving for a place like Factor that's more uh, nimble, um, but also making sure that you're sustaining the cultures that you're, you're known for. Milana, I don't know, maybe you could start us off there. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that's, you know, there, there is this inherent tension between, you know, making this remote environment a situation, you know, in which everybody can thrive and doing everything you can to make this as painless and as effective and as innovative and as awesome as you possibly can. Um, you know, but then that does make it harder down the road to sort of draw people back in, right? So I think there is that that kind of inherent tension. And I think, you know, we do know that there are things that we are missing, right? And, and, and even if they're hard to identify, I think we know that you know, there are those sort of elevator conversations that we're missing in this new uh, in this new environment. And we don't yet know to our earlier conversation what the cost of, of missing those things are yet. We sort of don't yet fully understand, nor could we, nor could anyone, you know, the impact of all of those things. So I think, you know, at, at this point, I think anybody in a leadership or management position, you know, needs to be doing a lot of listening and a lot of communicating because it's very clear to me that you know nobody nobody wants exactly the same thing. There really isn't a one size fits all approach. You know what works for me as a mother of four young children is going to be you know a very different set of needs than you know a a young single guy, right? I mean, there's going to be all kinds of different needs. And some of it is generational. And we talked about that. Maybe some people are used to a certain way of doing things and others are more open to a more radical change. But, you know, even within generations, you know, there's a difference of opinion. You know, there are people who, you know, who are have been here for 40 years and are never have never been happier than they are at this moment to not be coming into the office every day. So, you know, it's just such an individual you know, decision and such, a, and it's so dependent on everybody's individual circumstances that I think, you know, as we are literally sort of in this moment digesting, we just need to be doing as much listening as we possibly can, you know, in the sense that that is information gathering, you know, and really helps us understand, you know, how could we design a system going forward that would be flexible enough to allow people 
you know, to get all of the good parts to sort of reap the benefits of, of this environment, you know, and, and also have some autonomy in the process, which I think is, is also going to be really key to allow people on some level to decide. I mean, you know, I have sat on many roundtables where people are, you know, having conversations about the future of the profession and people are sort of pitching ideas and, you know, throwing out things like, well, maybe it will be you have to come into the office three days a week and maybe it will be that you have to come in 50% of your time or all of these metrics and none of that matters if you can't really put some teeth around that. Like what does, if we make everyone come in three days for what? You know, if, if none of your team is there, are you getting any of the things, you know, that we want you to get from an in-office experience? So I think you have to be just very deliberate about how you think about it as well. You know, not just throwing out a random number of days. There's no magic to three days. You know, it's, it's more than zero days, but, you know, without a structure or architecture in place to try to replicate some of the things we're missing, you know, that it, it sort of becomes meaningless, which I guess takes us back to measurement. You can tell that I'm sort of stuck on that piece of it. But, you know, wanting to make sure that we're deliberate, that we listen, we recognize one size doesn't fit all and that we're deliberate in whatever it is that we approach, right? Whatever it is that we're ultimately going to going to pitch, right, it has to be a really thoughtful uh, a thoughtful approach that we really think is, is going to be rooted in, in some sound knowledge of what we think will work. Yeah, uh, a, a couple of things. One, you've just reminded me that you have four kids under nine, which makes me just <laughs> blows me away that you do all that you do with with four little kids. Um, but also, you know, you and I come from a professional development background too, and even pre-COVID, that was the challenge, right? How do we measure the effectiveness of these programs? Are people coming in naturally, sort of talented in these impact skills, or is it a result of this specific program um, that that we're finding that out? Um, but I. I I think you're right about the intentionality of thinking about the, the in-person requirement, because one scenario that I could see is there's not a clear roadmap, there's not an intentionality, and people start, you know, slowly coming back to the office, and then they're just scheduling meetings the way that we always did, based on people's calendar availability. So then pretty soon, you're sort of back to exactly where you were before, um, because people are just scheduling as they did before. So how are we thinking even about scheduling? Um, are there are there hot times of the week when when we recommend scheduling and and days that you know we encourage remote? Um, I don't know, but I, I could see it pretty quickly reverting without a lot of thought. And Marcel, I'm wondering if you have thoughts to add. Yeah, I was going to add that it's just a, a very difficult question, and no law firm has it figured out in terms of striking the balance between work from home and coming into the office. Um, and part, I think that's because working remotely has gone so well. And um, I can tell you, not many firms are in a rush to go back to the office. I was uh, on a call uh, this morning with an office managing partner of a, a large firm in a big city. And you know what he said to me was, look, I don't care if we're the last firm in the city to have in-person operations. Um, you know, We're doing what makes sense for us and ultimately, you know, what's safe and what's comfortable. And that's the same position that, you know, we've taken at, at Ballard. Um, and no one's in a rush. No one has it figured out. I think it's going to evolve organically. And I do think some of it's going to be geographic uh, and sort of what the rules are in certain lo localities and um, the culture of certain places. You know, I think a place like Philadelphia is going to, you know, move at a different pay, play, uh, pace than, you know, pick a city in the Midwest or down South you know, just because we're dealing with different rules. And, you know, even in an office or a firm like Ballard, you know, you can see that there are just different offices where they're going into the office more frequently than New York or, or Philadelphia or DC. And so it wouldn't surprise me if you see um, a, a faster, you know, ramp up in some other places than you do uh, in cities like, you know, Philadelphia, for example. Yeah, Milana, did you see, did you have something to add there? Off. Yeah, just, you know, I, I think that's totally true that, you know, we have 13 offices and they're all at different stages and have been, you know, throughout the pandemic of, you know, of everybody's in all the time or nobody's in and hasn't been for some time. And, you know, so, so you see that, you know, even within the umbrella of one firm, a lot of differences, 
you know, depending on, on where you are. And then you layer on top of that, that our offices are, are international, you know, and, and then you also have cultural differences that come into play. And, um, so it, you know, it becomes, um, you know, very complicated even under one umbrella with one firm. So, you know, it does, it, it, yes. And I would just also echo that no firm has, has sort of solved the, the $10,000 question here. It, it is a really difficult one and, and one that I think, you know, the, the, the data is still evolving, you know, as we're in this. And so every time you think you know something, you know, that you learn something new. And so I think that makes it especially challenging that we're all in sort of this, time of tremendous uncertainty where it's hard to predict, you know, even what's coming ahead. I have all these moments where I remember back to the first two weeks of the pandemic where, you know, I, I naively thought this would only last for two weeks. You know, that's what I thought at that time. Oh, we're just going to go home for two weeks, you know, and I sort of look back at myself and think, oh my gosh, you had no idea. <laughs> and then here we are now, you know, all this time later. So so it is, it's hard to predict and, and lots of uncertainty and that, that makes it difficult to make these big, heavy, loaded decisions. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because you and Marcel both made a point that, that's been particularly interesting to me given our industry, which is that nobody has it figured out. Um, I initially started thinking about this with OCI last summer once it was switched to virtual in January for the first time ever. And it seems like both, you know, such a nebulous, time to navigate, but it also seems like this really interesting moment where all of these organizations that are, you know, have their different cultures, but are also very similar in the way that they approach their business model and the way that their work is managed um, and could offer opportunities for firms that are, you know, willing to take some chances or, or think in innovative ways about how they charge out of this a little bit different than their peers might. And, and I don't know whether that's been part of the conversations um, that, that you, Marcel and Milana have had in your organization or Ed, that you're keeping an eye on um, from an ALSP perspective, like our firms fully taking advantage of this moment um, or is a place like Factor gonna be quick to move in because you're thinking in different ways. And Milana, I, I don't know whether you want to talk about that and then I'll jump over to Ed, um, you know, whether there are advantages for like the, the first person to move and do something different or whether that's, you know, out of character for big law firms, which tend to be a little bit risk averse and a wait and see approach to we'll see how, you know, Ballard Spar does it and see what happens um, before we're going to adopt it here. Yeah, I mean, I will say from a from a you know a law firm perspective, you know, this has been you know, and I say this with all you know all knowledge of how painful and challenging this time has been for everybody, and that has been a, a heavy load for everybody to to bear because it's not been easy for many. Um, but but setting that aside, it has been in many ways you know a very you know dynamic and interesting time to be in this space because there is all this tremendous opportunity for innovation now. You know, because the facts, the basic facts on the ground that we have been dealing with for many, many years changed completely dramatically. And so, you know, anytime something that is as significant as that happens, like the opportunity for innovation is huge. And so, you know, we, you have to rethink how you do everything, you know, recruiting, like the example you just gave is a great one. You know, now all of a sudden we've done the entire recruiting process virtually, and that has literally never happened before. And so you have to rethink everything about recruiting from the beginning to the end. What really matters? What do we have to retain? How can we replicate? How do we tell people and teach people and show people about our culture when we're doing this, you know, in these funny little boxes? Like, how do we get people the information they need? And so intellectually, that's a very, you know, exciting exercise, right? Because you really sort of have to think very deeply. I think there is, you know, certainly in, in any time like that, there would be opportunities. There's opportunities to do things better. I think you know it's hard to want to be the first one in part because you do that at your own peril. Because what if something changes tomorrow? And so I think you know announcing a strategy early is you know is not that tempting for that reason because the facts on the ground are still changing so rapidly. So I think you know you want to make the decision. Anyone wants to make the decision when you have the best set of information in front of you. And I think we just haven't fully 
gotten there yet. I mean, look, we'd love to crack the code and come up with a genius way of doing things that no one thought of. We'd love to do that. Everyone would. But, um, but yes, I think it's been scary to really sort of be out there and move quickly just because we know so little, all of us. You know, I think uh, there are a couple things. I, I agree with that. Um, there's still a lot that's still being learned. Uh, there are a couple things that are like sort of um, these things can't not be true, right? Like um, in general, for businesses writ large, including law firms, ALSPs, everybody, um, t and &E expenses are down. People are not getting on planes and flying all over the world to go see clients and people are not setting up war rooms and courtrooms that are not that are conducting their hearings virtually. Um, some of that has come back, certainly, as like, you know, we've kind of reached an equi equilibrium. But there if there was X percentage of revenue that was set aside for t and &E in 2020, uh, almost every single organization will have come in significantly below that budget. And that tends to go to the bottom line as an operating expense. Right. Um, there are real estate costs. There are other things that have typically gone down. Now, there are some interesting areas where investments need to be made that haven't been made yet and continue to create friction. Um, and that might be some of the innovation or even like less innovative, but just kind of technology budgets, right? Marcel was talking about like laptops and being able to take them home and how that was a massive enabler. Like, I mean, everybody is dealing with their home internet and are my, you know, kids trying to do their virtual guitar lesson at the same time or whatever. And like, is that messing up with my, you know, my deposition or, you know, like, how is it, how is this, how is this all kind of coming together? And there's just a, there's a large amount of, you know, or like is a lawyer showing up as a cat on a zoom. You know, like there are, there's a, a, there are many ways that people are showing grace in these moments and just being like, okay, you know what though? It's just, it's crazy times. We're all going to be okay with it until that is over until there is an expectation, there's a new standard of professionalism in working remotely. There are these things these, the, that, that come back into conduct um, and then people will be held accountable to. Clients will expect, you know, um, uh, opposing counsel in, in negotiating deals or judges in cases will expect. And I think that when that comes to, to, to bear, there will be things like, okay, maybe the office space, space per, you know, lawyer or per professional in my law firm is like a lot lower as, as a matter of expense, but we might be needing to ship out, you know, work from home, work remotely, you know, technology kits that include sort of like, you know, layers of redundancy to make sure there's no business interruption. Um, should that, should, should X, Y, Z type thing happen? Um, you know, there's also uh, something else that maybe we haven't talked about quite so much, but like just that COVID-19 is like a sickness and it's taking people out of commission and that many times our human value chains are actually interrupted because there are single points of failure. If there is a key partner that is working a multi-billion dollar deal or a massive you know, piece of litigation and she or he gets COVID and is knocked out of the commission for who knows how long, like that by itself, like the pandemic actually has like a very direct effect outside of just the fact that the world is shut down. Um, and so there are ways that like, there are kind of like hidden costs there, but there are moments for advantage in terms of the ability for, um, you know, expense lines to go down that are just, that may become the new normal, uh, while we calibrate all these unknowns and figure this stuff out. Um, I do think that, uh, you know, as you study kind of like business of law and clients dealing with, with firms and, and, you know, like what are, is there like, were people asking for like a COVID discount on fees and things like that? I mean, there are a whole number of dynamics that are at play there. Uh, and we, it kind of remains to be seen how things get shaken out. You know, the last thing I'll just say on that topic of like where there's competitive advantage, I mentioned this idea around like recruiting talent more broadly. Uh, I have not been tracking this in terms of the law firm world, but I would be curious to see if, you know, blended rates are starting to prevail, if there are more sort of national rates that are starting to prevail because, you know, regional rates seem like a little bit difficult to rationalize when, nobody's in the office and like, you know, like the kind of proximity to the actual physical location is sort of becoming less of, you know, there's cost of living and there are things like that obviously st still are in play to defend those rates, but there's also sort of like some of those, um, uh, some of those kind of um, uh, pillars that kind of support that logic are starting to erode, I think, because we're all being brought into like a virtual work environment kind of against our will. Um, and I'm curious to see if there's like an economic play also for, let's say, firms with 
larger quality, uh, you know, quantities of excellent attorneys in sort of like non like top cola, most expensive city markets, whether or not there's like some kind of advantage that that's now happening by bringing some of this great legal town. This is the LSP playbook, but I think that this is happening, you know, across the legal industry. Yeah. And a, a few things you said there, Ed, that I think are really interesting. Um, the point about budgets in certain areas really sort of plummeting as a result of the, the pandemic and coupled with, you know, best practices that our colleagues over at Wharton would advise in other industries, which is taking that extra money right. while you're still doing well uh, from a profitability standpoint and investing it in internal innovation projects or experiments that are designed to be uh, short term that can provide lessons to you about this is not going to work for our clients in a post-COVID world. This though might, and we can, you know, take this and run with it when we know that our t &E budget is going to rebound and maybe some of our capital investment um, in real estate will come back in the same way. Um, so, you know, to the extent that firms are trying to get ahead of it, investing those resources now during this strange time. Um, and then you talked about, um, which I think is a really good point, and if we have time, maybe we could talk a little bit about it, about the nature of the, the pandemic itself, that this is impacting people's physical health and also their mental health. And I think that that's, you know, we were just starting <laughs> like baby steps toward um, moving the needle on attorney well-being in our organizations. And now we have this just hugely disruptive and traumatic event happening around us that's impacting our workforce. But, but it's, it strikes me as one of those other unknowns. Like we, we know so little about what our workforce is going through. And I don't know whether Marcel or Milana, you have thoughts about, you know, how to strike the balance between making sure that your, your workforce feels supported and has resources with, you know, protecting them from even more intrusion into their personal lives, which has sort of been the experience of the last year. Um, but that strikes me as another sort of outcome of this, just the underlying nature of the challenge. Marcel? Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a really good question. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a struggle that I think law firms had before, you know, just in terms of uh, checking on attorneys and, and ensuring that their well-being uh, was, was, was cared for. Um, you know, I think both in, both in government and in private practice, what I've seen is you know, efforts to make sure that managers, department heads, whoever the whatever the case may be, are equipped with the tools to identify things like, you know, depression or anxiety um, and understanding what the symptoms might be, you know, looking for, you know, change in behavior and then figuring out, you know, ways to address it, you know, the tools to have certain conversations if it gets to that point. Um, and I'm sure other law firms or law firms across the country are doing similar similar things, because it is really important because, you know, as it was said before, this is impacting people physically and then also, um, you know, their, their mental health. Um, so absolutely. I think it's, you know, top of mind for everyone. And it's something that uh, we need to keep thinking about and, and perfect it because this isn't going anywhere any, anytime soon. I think we're going to be in this space, you know, for a long time. And, you know, even, um, you know, earlier we were talking about when folks start to go back into the office, it's going to take, a while or it's going to be really difficult for some folks to unremote their their lives right you know it's just going to be a lot easier for some other other folks and you know you're going to need to support them in different kind of ways so i think you know absolutely if, if you're running any kind of organization that issue has to be top of mind yeah milana did you want to jump in yeah i mean i i just would echo everything that marcel just said you know it has to be top of mind and i think this is another example where you know the remote environment cuts both ways like i one thing that i rely on you know to know how my team is doing is you know is seeing them and seeing how they're doing and my assistant who i've worked with for you know more than a decade at this point when i walk in the door in the morning and ask you know, I say good morning to him and I can tell by the way he says good morning back to me, how he's doing, <laughs> you know, he says it, you know, there, there's a, there's just something in the tone that you interpret, right? It's sort of human interaction and you can tell, oh, he's had a bad day, you know, he's having a bad day, it's, you know, something isn't right and I can pick that up almost instantly and so you do lose that, you know, in a Zoom call, in a Zoom setting, it's harder to pick up on those nuances and so I worry about that, but 
you know, the flip side of that would be a lot of a lot of studies have shown that you know, being in a remote environment allows people to do things that do contribute to wellness. Like for example, it's easier to exercise when you're not commuting because now you have more time, you know, you sort of get that time back. People are sleeping better if they're not trying to, you know, get everything ready so they can get out the door and get on a train and commute an hour and a half wherever they're going. And, you know, so, so that's, you know, another example of how there are real pros and cons to that. And so, you know, you have to look at all of those to try to determine, you know, we want to keep some of those things, you know, it's nice that people can exercise that leads to lots of good things, right? You can jump, you can go for a run at two o'clock. If you don't have a meeting, you could never have done that, you know, in the past, but uh, but you do have to be mindful of, you know, how, how are you going to check in on your team if somebody's always on, you know, never on camera for a team meeting, you know, that may be an indicator that something isn't right. And it may also be an indicator that they're wearing their Christmas pajamas and they don't want you to see that, you know, and that's fine too. So I think you just have to be really attuned to what what the new clues would be if it isn't someone saying good morning to you in the morning, you know, then you have to figure out, well, how am I going to assess and you have to be really mindful and again deliberate about how you're doing that yeah and i just you know milana said you said something at the very outset you know around it's one of the big unknowns is how are we evaluating the efficacy of like people management and leadership in like a remote environment and i think that this is actually going to be a moment for great leadership to step up uh, being that having that attuned that sort of uh, attuned sense of you know improved intuition of um really being able to read your people, um, doing that in really like a much more constrained, like I said, people are two by two inches like on my screen. And like, that's, that's my entire experience of that person. And I think I was reading a study where, you know, people will get on calls and everyone's screen is off and everyone's on mute. And you're trying to give like a presentation, you're getting zero like visual feedback and you have no idea how it's landing. I mean, these are all things that just are going to require you know, a, a real opportunity, frankly, for, for leaders to step up and find ways to be agile and to kind of flex some of that, that, um, you know, some of those soft skills. And I'd say also, you know, there's actually, when it comes to like that mental health piece uh, and being able to set, you know, um, the stage for expectations inside of, I would say, you know, large law firms definitely are demanding workplaces that really require a lot from people. And um, like you were saying, Jen, like, oh, we're just starting to kind of start to understand and grapple with like where we are. And then suddenly this thing hits and it's kind of like, well, we, everyone's got to learn how to swim really quickly. Um, but I think I read something out of McKinsey that was saying like a senior leader or a partner there was saying, you know, I basically gave my team's permission um, to sort of uh, and, and set expectations on availability by saying like, I'm going to be available from like 7.30 AM to like 6 PM. And my assistant will schedule every call in that part in that period of time. And anything outside of those hours, I will, individually assess whether or not I'm going to take that call or not. And it seemed like that cascaded because leaders set a shadow and they cast a long shadow in their organization and people will follow that lead and feel like they've permission to actually act similarly. And so I just think that this is like a really singular moment for leaders. Uh, and that's really going to kind of play out, you know, there, there will be winners and losers. I'm, uh, let's be honest. I think that there will be some that respond better than others. Um, but I think that that will also be something that gets very observable uh, as we get into kind of the next phase of this. Yeah, I think those are really great points. And and actually they tie back to, to an experience I had earlier today, which was that the first meeting I've been on where, um, you know, people are working on a project to try to use this moment to enhance um, the legal profession. And it was the first time I heard people start to worry that we're going to run out of time in this moment um, to actually make real movement. And it sort of ties into um, what you're both talking about and the intentionality of leaders. Um, you know, we've been, we're almost a year into this and there was this disorientation phase, but now we have, we hope a limited amount of time before we're safely able to return. So um, it, it seems to me like the big takeaway from what we've talked about so far is intentionality, um, you know, experimentation and learning what works best for people and um, in communication to Milana's point about talking with your workforce, listening to your workforce, um, not necessarily making any promises about what the post environment will look like, but taking into consideration people's preferences and allowing them to be heard. Um, so we've just covered so much ground and I wish that we had three hours <laughs> to talk about all of this, but unfortunately we are at just about uh, four Eastern Standard Time. 
So at this point, I know that our audience, I saw a bunch of questions coming up in the chat. So at this point, I'm going to bring to the webinar one of our fantastic uh, 2L law students here at Penn Law, Lexi Levine. And Lexi is going to start us off by sharing the next CLE word with those who are seeking CLE. And then she's going to pose to the panelists a couple of the most popular questions from the audience before we conclude this part portion of the program. So Lexi, could you take us uh, into the Q&A? Great. Thank you so much, Jen. And thank you to all the panelists for the great discussion. The next CLE passcode is bike. And I'll repeat that once more. The next CLE passcode is bike. And let's see. So we, I've been monitoring the Q&A, the questions submitted throughout. And let's start with Joseph Hayeson asked a great question. He said, isn't there a great danger that those who return to the office will get the informal and socialization experiences while those who can or want to work remotely will become or perhaps continue to be work drones? And isn't it necessary to put everyone on the same level and mandate work in the office once we can? And maybe Marcel, you kind of touched on this earlier. So maybe I'll start with you. Yeah, um, I, I think in an ideal world, right, you would have everyone uh, sort of on the same playing field. But uh, I just, just don't think it's going to be possible. I think it's going to have to be a staggered approach. And there's just going to be flexibility uh, that you're going to need to have for um, the entire office. And, you know, folks are going to have to have discretion based on, you know, their own personal uh, situation. But, you know, just, just going back to the idea of, you know, what working remotely has done to folks. I mean, some people have thrived in a remote environment just based on their personality, um, you know, whether it's introversion or just the way they organize their work. Um, you know, some folks are, they love the fact that they can schedule social time uh, and not be interrupted uh, while they're writing a brief or, you know, uh, looking at a contract or something of that nature. Um, so I do think, you know, even if we do stagger the return to work, you are going to see some folks who might take it a little bit slower because it, you know, fits their personality style a little bit more. Um, so I don't think there's a risk of, you know, having folks just uh, completely abandoned or, or turn into drones, as was said, but um, I just, I don't see any other way around it other than to, you know, have a, uh, you know, progressive return to work and remaining flexible for folks based on their individual situations. Yeah, you know, just one thing I'll add to that, um, working remotely is challenging and some of us have been doing it for a long time before the pandemic. And I remember as an executive Thomson Reuters, leading teams, being in meetings, you know, like leadership team meetings, and then I dial out of the conference. And then I know there's like a meeting after the meeting. I'm like, oh, that sucks. Like I'm not in that meeting after the meeting where other people are kind of like getting into corners and having offline discussions and like that, that that's, that's annoying. Um, and you just find other ways to compensate for that. And I think that the one thing to keep in mind that I think is still like a very highly held virtue at any kind of legal services organization, especially at, you know, top law firms, um, is that like nobody's going to ignore great talent. Uh, if you are an extremely capable lawyer and you happen to be working remotely, I, I, I cannot imagine that somehow you're not going to be leveraged to the best benefit of your clients. Like that's, that doesn't make sense. Um, now, Sometimes I, I do understand the sentiment. Sometimes you feel like, you, you know, you want to be like in the room where it happens, right? Like you want to sort of be inside those conversations. But, um, but I think that in general, the talent uh, won't be ignored. Everyone wants to be utilized. People want to be put to their highest and best use. Uh, and people know that like not being in the office is not something that uh, people have influence or control over. And so hopefully those dynamics play out. I do understand that there is that, you know, mentality, but I would hope that that's not an, a prevailing wind, you know, among other vectors that are sort of. Great, thank you. Um, Milana, did you want to add anything? I'm sorry, I missed the question. I kept getting kicked out for some reason. I have terrible internet today. I'm so sorry, I've done a million of these and today seems to be not my lucky day with the internet connection. So I missed the question, but I'm happy to, I'm happy to weigh in on, on it if you can tell me what it is. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, we, uh, we were just talking about the return to the office and how it may put people on different playing fields um, with some the people returning, kind of getting the socialization experiences while those 
who choose or have to stay remote kind of fall behind in a certain respect and continue to be um, work drones, so to speak. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, look, I think that's a, you know, a legitimate concern that, you know, the people who can, you know, are the winners and the people who, you know, can't for whatever reason, you know, may, may get the less desirable work or that that may be how it, how it ultimately breaks. But, you know, I do think a lot of what we do is done in our offices with the door shut, trying to concentrate, you know, and so that, you know, you could really produce very, very high quality work never coming in at all. And certainly I won't suggest that the human interactions that happen in person don't matter, but, you know, I do think it is possible and I have seen it over the past nine months for people to do extraordinary work in this way and may even be easier for some people to do work, you know, without all of the distractions that come along because not everything that happens in the office is a positive, right? Some of that is a negative, right? And there is, you know, stuff that maybe, maybe you're better off if you can, you know, literally not be exposed to some of the office drama and politics that exist in every office on some level. So, you know, you will, it won't be the same, but there may be some benefits at the same time. Um, and I don't think, I think I heard the end of Ed's answer that, that it's ultimately, that we should conclude it's insurmountable or that it's on its face, not possible, right? I think there's enough there that that we could make it work. And I think the, you know, the benefit of offering flexibility and having it be the kind of thing where, you know, people, people could ultimately opt in or not um, would, would probably outweigh the alternative, which is everyone has to do the same thing. And I think that we know doesn't work. There isn't really a one size fits all approach. There's no one set of guidelines that we could do that everyone would love and thrive in. So, um, so it's always gonna be a balance of some kind. Great, thank you so much. And our second question is from Anna Gavin and she asked, are you seeing legitimate support for working parents, specifically mothers? Um, and I guess maybe Milana, I'll start with you being a working mother at a big law firm. Yeah, so we have been very, very focused on trying to provide support for working mothers, recognizing that that is critical and that, you know, the, the burden on working parents in general, you know, mothers and fathers is tremendous um, at this moment in time. So we have done a lot of things to, to try to deliberately support them, um, including a, a weekly working group that gets together and meets over Zoom and um, you know, we do try to have some substantive programming from time to time. That was sort of our original vision is let's get together and talk about like, how can we still make healthy meals for our kids? And then within about five minutes, it just it, it devolved into like, let's just all complain. And, and that had a value too, right? We all just sort of were able to, you know, to find comfort in the fact that, you know, we were not alone and others were experiencing similar struggles. And, you know, that's been a really, a really powerful way to connect and just to, you know, to tap into that community of people who are experiencing something similar, right? We all have the shared experience. And, and that group, I will say, is for, for men and women, for mothers and fathers, for anybody that is going through that experience and, and trying to, you know, trying to get through and one foot in front of the other. So, so we've done that, but that's, you know, that's one example of many things that we have tried to be recognizing that, you know, the burden on working parents is is extreme and that, you know, for mothers in particular, looking at, you know, just at the data uh, around working parents in general, you can tell that, you know, a lot of, a lot of working parents and mothers in particular are, are opting out. And so I think all firms need to be super mindful of that at this moment in time, if you're not thinking about what that group is experiencing and trying to offer support to them, you know, that's, that's a big mistake. And I think you do that at your own peril. You know, anybody who isn't taking that into account right now um, is, is making a mistake. Great, thank you. And um, Marcel and Ed, as working parents or you know colleagues of working parents, do you want to maybe add anything to that as well? Yeah, I'll just I'll quickly add that it's um, I think been really helpful for law firms to uh, increase the amount of resources they have available. Um, you know, bringing employee assistance providers on board, or you know, increasing the amount of services they offer you know, things like stress check-ins, um, you know, providing resources that cover all the stressors of the pandemic, you know, caregiving for elderly parents or children, you know, there's been disruption to school programs, um, you know, financial issues, grief and sadness. I mean, you know, you have law firms offering services to cover 
you know, the entire gamut. So I think um, that that's extremely important. And I think there's also an element of feedback where, you know, firms will say, if this isn't enough, you know, let us know, because I think there is that sensitivity there and, you know, your best asset is your people and you want to make sure that, you know, your, your folks feel supported. Yeah. And I'll just, I'll just agree with everything that was said. And there's things you do by policy. There's things you do by benefit. Uh, and there's things you do by culture. And part of it is like when everyone really had their kids at home and, you know, con- uh, opted to continue to be online and to be working. Like sometimes you see a kid like jump on your lap in the middle of a call and it's just being okay with it. You know, again, leaders can set a shadow here and uh, making sure that people feel like they have permission to just understand that they're everyone's lives are a little crazy and everyone's doing the best they can. And I've, I've, by the way, noticed and and have great gratitude for our clients for being similarly accommodating. Like we're all in in this together. Um, And there's that cultural piece that that comes along with it as well. And I will not to sound like a broken record on this point, but I do think, you know, there are benefits for working parents of being home. You know, if I look at my own situation, you know, we're, we're just coming off a very busy recruiting season, which in years past would have required that I'd be in the office constantly, you know, working like an investment banker, right, to sort of run this very busy, very compressed season. And, you know, now I have been able to do all of that and yet not sacrifice, you know, seeing my children, you know, or being able to, you know, to participate in bath time and bedtime and all of that. And so, you know, to be able to have the busiest season work absolutely no less and potentially more but not sacrifice that sort of face time with them, which you can argue whether that matters in the workplace or not, but I promise you it matters as a parent, right? You know, to be able to connect with them, I have never seen them more consecutively than I have in this, in this period of time. And, you know, that has been a miraculous gift. So I think that's something also to bear in mind that it isn't only a negative on parents in some ways, this is really shifted the focus. And to Ed's point, it's brought, you know, parenting to the forefront, it, it is now clearly a part of who I am in a way that can't be denied when my child interrupts an important meeting to say that we're out of Cheez-Its and I then have to deal with the Cheez-It crisis in a public way. But, you know, I do, I do think there are benefits um, to all of that as well. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you for the insight. I think we just have time for one more question very quickly. Um, And I'll put this to Ed because he kind of talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, Given our current environment, what key skills or abilities are you looking for in recruits that may be different or of greater priority than in the recent past? I think kind of alluding to the increased talent pool that you discussed earlier. Yeah, I think we uh, are always looking for excellent talent. We can expand our net as to where that talent sits. And I think that that's just, you know, a, a world is flat kind of moment. Like there is fantastic talent all around this world. Uh, that go to sort of the, um, you know, just have elite preparation, uh, academic uh, preparation and experience and uh, just in countries all over the world and our ability to kind of tap into that um, because, you know, as an alternative legal service provider, we provide, you know, really complex legal services that are not really legal practice, right? It's not legal advice. It's not, you know, attorney client relationship, but it's frequently very complex, you know, services and being able to kind of as a result of that we don't need to necessarily be constrained to sort of like are you licensed to be barred to be in this state or this and so our sort of geographic scope has broadened and then with sort of the work remote we're able to just to get more people um, and just cast that net wider in terms of the skills and the talent profile i'd say that we have a little bit more of a bias and i didn't get it like i didn't really get to talk about this too much but really uh, or i kind of forgot to mention it um, technology and innovation is now a mandate. It, you, you, can't do, you can't do this job without it. Um, you know, and I think that, um, you know, I put another reference to the cat on, on the Zoom call, but like, I think that you just cannot do this job now, any longer without um, having some chops in, in technology. And I think that there's a real misconception that sort of a millennial or post-millennial generation of, you know, new lawyers that are really good with their iPhone, that that equates to technology fluency. It does not. Um, And so people who can understand data, who can understand um, ways to be more process rigorous, which is very much our secret sauce, who can understand ways to take, you know, attorney thinking and best practices and knowledge and convert that into a decision tree, not an overall perfectly prescriptive one, but one that provides framework and structure to the way that this is handled. And it's a little bit less bespoke Um, that these are skills that we're looking for. I'm, I'm always looking for more talent. 
um, to kind of drive the industry forward also and to um, enable that in, and, and those people with those that possess those types of talents and skills, I know that they'll be particularly set up for success in the current environment. And that does make a difference. And that, you know, I don't want that to, I don't want to over rotate on that bias. I don't want to say like, well, as a result, like, you know, other really talented people before COVID like are somehow going to be overlooked, but I I'm also willing to openly admit that like, we need excellent people now. And that excellence, you know, one of those kind of baselines for that is, is the ability to uh, work remotely, navigate technology, you know, pretty seamlessly uh, introduce very little friction to the ability to work in the current environment. Yeah, I'll just quickly add to that. I agree with everything that Ed said. Technology, absolutely important. Um, one, one quality I would say that's uh, really important in this environment is um, knowing, to add, knowing when to ask for help, right? I think being you know, autonomous and being a self-starter, that's absolutely key. But um, you know, asking for help is something that's on, a lot of, on, on the minds of a lot of law firms because what you don't want to happen is you know, associates who are new to the practice not asking questions and, you know, possibly committing malpractice or, or doing something that, you know, injures a client um, because they don't have the luxury of just walking down a hall and saying to a senior associate, hey, here's a quick question that I have. Or, you know, they're not running into the partners and saying, you know, look, this issue came up and they're not getting that, you know, guidance in the same channel. Um, but instead, you're kind of home figuring it out on your own. So you, you really want to know that folks have a good gauge for when to reach out and ask for help so that the firm isn't you know, um, you know, suffering any adverse consequences. Great, thank you so much. And unfortunately, it looks like we are running out of time. Um, I know there's lots of questions we didn't get to, but thank you to the audience for your thoughtful questions. And thank you again to the panelists for the great discussion. I know I really enjoyed it. And now I'll pass it back to Jen for some final comments. Um, Ed's question perfectly primes us for next week's conversation about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, and I really want to thank our experts today for sharing what we know is their very valuable time with us, helping us answer a few questions, but really generating more questions that those in leadership positions will need to think about and explore in the years ahead. Um, I want to really thank Naoshi Giles from our conferences and events, uh, conferences and events team, Dalila Lewis from Future of the Profession Initiative, and Chris Olson from our ITS for partnering with us to bring this conversation to life. We hope you'll help us improve our programming by sharing your feedback in the survey linked in the chat. Uh, our next webinar, as I mentioned, will take place next Wednesday, also from 3 to 4.15 Eastern Standard Time. And you can learn more and register at futureofthelegalprofession.org. So now we're going to take a quick break, a uh, bio break, but we hope that many of you will join us to continue exploring these topics. I know there were lots of questions we didn't get to, um, and we'll have a chance to discuss those together at 4.30 Eastern Standard Time. You'll receive an in email in the next few minutes from Penn Law's conferences and events team, and that will contain a link to our post-webinar discussion. So for those who aren't able to join us, we thank you for attendance today, for your attendance today, and look forward to seeing you at other programs in the future. And for everyone else, we will see you in just a few minutes uh, to debrief the excellent conversation we had with our guests. So thank you, everybody, and stay safe.